Our scripture reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, <clears throat> he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owned money, owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. And you, she wet, has wet my hair with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Debbie. I know that I personally am enjoying going through Luke because my sermons keep getting longer. I don't know if that's to your benefit or not, but I... Uh, I am enjoying the study of, of, of Luke and getting a little more in-depth into the story and how this story is not only just only taking place here in the book of Luke, but it happens across the Gospels as well. The story of this woman who washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and with her hair is one of the most moving emotional accounts in all the New Testament. And I'm, I'm not willing to give you my top five, but this is definitely, in the, I, I put it in the top three, really. But I think there's three principal characters in this entire story that, that uh, Debbie just read for us this morning. We, we know that there's our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he's the star of the entire story. This is the whole point of it. This is the good news of his life. And he, unlike the others, deals with this woman in a loving and forgiving way. And then we have this woman who's never named by name. And she is the recipient of Jesus' forgiveness. And she represents the sin or the sinners who are strangely attracted to Jesus. They come in droves. And at the, well, the Pharisees don't like that, right? So we have the, the host of this entire party. We have Simon, who is a Pharisee. And, and as such, he represents at least the perception of, that sinners have for the church and Christians that we want to keep them away. We want to keep a separation between the two. And Jesus is pretty clear about not living into that. Each of the Gospels has their own account of this story as well, about a woman coming to Jesus' feet. And let us briefly consider these accounts. If you want to write these down real quick, you can. I don't have it on the overhead for you, so you're going to have to write down quickly. But we have an account in Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, 6 through 13. It's the same story. But we also have it in Mark, chapter 14. Verses 3 through 9. Then we have it in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, 1 through 8. The biggest difference amongst all three of these stories, uh, the thrust of it is that if, well, I'll just read Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 8, for instance. It says, When the disciples saw this, when they saw the woman cleaning, they were indignant. Why is this waste? They asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price, and the money could have been given to the poor. And aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? And that's kind of the thrust of all three stories from that. Luke is a different story. 
Now, I know for a lot of people who don't have a faith or don't have hope in Jesus Christ, when they hear these stories and recognize there's some differences in here. In fact, in the Gospel of John, they identify the woman as Mary, the sister of Martha, who we talked about last week. Is this the same story? Is this a different story? In the Gospel of John, it identifies the disciple who calls out Jesus as Judas. The other, they don't they recognize who is the person who spoke out. And I know that a lot of people get uncomfortable when we talk about Scripture and there's some things that don't seem to jive and to fit and it makes us uncomfortable. I, I thought Scripture was perfect and errant. And I would absolutely agree. It is. It is perfect. I'm so thankful that we have the Scripture we can go back to. I have a friend, I have a couple friends who are a Columbus Police Department and, and one of them is actually a, a detective and he, he works in homicide. So he's He's got all sorts of stories you don't want to hear, right? But one of the things that he has told me and taught me is about collusion. And we heard about this word that came out in 2016, 17, 18 on the news all the time. The word collusion. That if people get together before they're interrogated, before they have to give testimony about what happened, they might collude together about the, how the story's going to go. And we know for a fact that out of the 12 disciples and all the other followers of Jesus Christ, there was no gathering of minds together to say, listen, this is the story. This is how we're going to get it together, right? Right? Yeah. This is how we're going to tell it. And so nobody will challenge it. But instead, we have these four Gospels with slight differences in them. And what my friend who works homicide told me, which I don't know if that's enough to make you think about this, but he seems to know what he's talking about, right? Right? But what he said was, if every story that comes into the interrogation room is exactly locked, stuck together, they all go, this is collusion. They're lying. They've put it together. But if there's little interesting, little differences in their stories, it helps them go, this is how somebody perceived what they saw. It may not be exactly how they saw it. It, it may be a six and somebody else saw a nine. Do you see how that might happen? That there might be little differences that happen in the story. But that does not distraught me from my faith in God. Because I've already experienced God in new and powerful ways. And I want to share that with you so you can have that experience. So then when we have these little differences in scripture, it doesn't shake our entire faith and it's falling apart. Instead, it solidifies. It helps us understand that it is a complex relationship. I, I sometimes struggle with this, and maybe you would as well. But nonetheless, all these accounts talk about a woman who shouldn't have been at the place that she was at, just as we heard last week about Mary. We have another woman who's in a place and experiencing something that nothing should have ever happened like this, ever. And in fact, it's a big black eye on Jesus as well that he thought it was okay. And he made it clear it was okay. Now, Simon, this was a common name that happened all through Scripture. It was kind of like having the last name Smith, for instance. And, and so because of that, we know that this name, name about this Pharisee, it could have been any Pharisee, but because in this one, it identifies them as Simon the Pharisee, not Simon the leper, we have some identification about what's going on in here. And in fact, the link between the two would have been unthinkable for this Pharisee and this sinful woman. And that's her only identification to us, is that her identity is the sinful woman. And because we have younger ears in the room, we're going to be sensitive about what the sinful woman is. But she is a member of the tribe, the, the oldest working group in the entire world, right? We know what she does for a living, and it is a sinful living. And so Luke's incident that uh, takes place for us, it occurs probably in a story maybe earlier in time than maybe the other ones. Maybe all three or all four of these stories were excerpts from different examples that took place through time. We, we, we more than likely do not associate Mary with the sinful woman of Martha and Mary, but maybe this is a story that took place earlier in time, and maybe Jesus had his feet anointed more than once. Maybe more than once. But Simon the Pharisee could not grasp in this story how Jesus could let such a sinful woman touch him. And while the disciples were troubled by the waste of the perfume, which could have been sold to, for money to help the poor, we're wrestling with a story that we sometimes don't understand the context of. I've mentioned before that we all have a frame of reference that when we look at these stories that helps us understand it. But sometimes we have to break that frame and reframe it because we're aware that we have a frame that's maybe a bit more limited. Here we are in 2023. We are 
middle class people here in America. There are some perceptions that we have about this study and this story that help us and maybe distract us from the understanding of this. For instance, some of us don't like talking about feet in this room. Is there anybody in this room who doesn't like talking about feet? Yeah, some of us just feel really uncomfortable talking about feet. Or the fact that somebody kissed feet. Or, or that there was any experience about, and even just me repeating the word feet. There's somebody in this room who's like, oh my gosh, stop it. But that's our cultural frame that we have about this story. For us to understand it, we may have to break our frame and reframe it for us to understand what was happening 2,000 years ago in this story. And all things considered, I personally believe, this is my belief, you could subscribe to it as well, or you could subscribe to it. But the incident described by Luke and his gospel may be different than the ones in Matthew, Mark, and John. And so I hope this morning, as you read through this story, maybe you take some time to read those four separate stories. Now, here's the setting for us in chapter 7. This is 36 through 39, if you're taking notes. But in Luke, we're not told precisely when this incident took place, other than the evening, because it's a meal, and nor the name of the city, nor the principal characters. We, but we do know, I'm sorry, we do know the principal characters, Jesus, Simon the Pharisee, and this woman with a, a soiled reputation. And it's interesting that Luke gives us the name of the host, but not the woman. He omits her name, and I hope, my opinion is, Maybe this was a gracious act, maybe done purposely to not slander her. And so when we look, it would seem that there are two people who are equally zealous to see Jesus. Simon the Pharisee and this sinful woman. And Simon could easily converse with Jesus in the comfort of his home around this mealtime. He probably had the means, he probably had the house, he maybe had also the servants to help with the, making this take place, that he didn't have to scurry around the kitchen like Martha last week to get ready for this moment. Maybe he had uh, family members, or maybe he had servants, people who were part of it. But for this woman, getting close to Jesus was no easy matter for her at all. In her sinful life, known to all who live in this town, it was made difficult for her and a woman to seek Jesus out a man, a teacher, a rabbi, would have not have been copacetic. It wouldn't have been okay at all. And if she owned a home and she wanted to invite Jesus to go to her home, it absolutely culturally would have been absolutely inappropriate, right? You could not invite Jesus there, for this would be inappropriate, especially if she was a member of this oldest union known to man. And then the oldest working profession, she would be inviting him to her place of business. Again, this would have been absolute taboo, right? So the reports of Jesus' ministry and his teaching had somehow reached this woman. I don't know. Maybe she is somebody who's having conversations with other people and she's not entirely shunned. Or maybe she's seeking out Jesus or maybe she's been following Jesus. We, we don't know. But we know that she has learned that Jesus was to have dinner at this house, at Simon's house. And she knew that it was her opportunity to see Jesus, even though it would have been inappropriate. From Scripture, it seems that she arrived at Simon's house before Jesus. And the Scripture says for us that you gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. Hmm. We, we imagine that probably dinner is taking place at sundown, and this woman made sure she was there before the sun went down. She's in preparation. And with her, she brought a container of perfume. And I, I'm going to guess that this woman came prepared to anoint Jesus' feet, a humble task, usually delegated to the lowest servant of the house or the, or the oldest member of the household, would have had the responsibility of cleaning Jesus' and all the other visitors to the house's their feet. But perhaps she would have been permitted to do this, this one thing, to bless Jesus' feet after they had been cleaned. But the washing of Jesus' feet can best be understood in the light of our, our Lord's word and his rebuke to Simon. That when compared to the Lord's washing of his disciples' feet from John chapter 13, this is very different. When Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples and his followers, he took time within that celebration, where they were celebrating the Passover feast, that nobody took the time to wash anybody's feet. And so they all came in with dirty, stinky, dusty feet. And Jesus called, time out. And he became the servant to all those people. And they all agreed, Jesus, you shouldn't be washing my feet. I should have done it. But none of them did it. And so there's Jesus, stripped down to his waist, cleaning the feet of all the disciples. 
Now again, context, dirty feet. My kids go out in the backyard barefoot and they play all the time. And they come back in the house, I hand them a wet wash rag and I say, clean off your feet. And it's done. But this is not the dirt that they have on their feet. It's not the topsoil from just the backyard. They are walking amongst all the animals and their waste that has fallen and made dusty trails and pathways. I don't know if you've ever spent time among uh, cattle or horses, but when, when they poo and it drops on the ground and it sits in the sun for a couple days, it becomes very fine dust. And so Jesus and his followers, as they follow this rabbi from town to town, they would follow behind him and they would be clouded by the dust of what they walked around on. If you've ever gone to a barn, there's always this light sheen of dust on everything. And some people call it horse magic. No. That's such a whimsical way to think about how much you love horses. Look at all this horse magic. That's like somebody doing a woodworking and calling dust a man glitter. It's not. Okay? And so Jesus is covered in fecal matter from his knees up and probably all through his face. And so before he would come to this meal, and he's not sitting at a regular table that we have, it would be a reclining, leaning table. But for him to do that, his feet are going to be out in front of somebody else, and their feet's going to be next to him, and they're not all sitting with their feet back like this. That would be uncomfortable, right? But they're leaning there, and they all have dirty, stinky feet, including the guest of this meal, Jesus. And so this woman, no doubt, waited near this door for Jesus to arrive, and to her surprise, maybe, she found Jesus with dirty feet. No one had taken the moment to grab a basin. She didn't bring one. Nobody had taken the moment to bring water. She didn't come prepared with water. And nobody brought a towel to dry off his feet. And nor did she. So imagine the look on her face when they realized that Jesus' feet weren't going to get washed as well. Nobody's feet got washed. And this might say something about the intention of Simon as well. That if he didn't take time or he didn't take the intention to make sure that Jesus' feet get washed. I, I don't know, but it makes me wonder, did Simon really want Jesus to come? Was he treating him like an ideal guest or was he just a guest that he wanted to test? But this woman, she did not let the dirty feet keep the Lord from her and what she intended to do. She dared not to kiss Jesus' face. That would have been the cultural experience at the time. Just as we do handshakes today, 2,000 years ago, they would have greeted each other with a kiss, which, again, that was the context of the time. But she dare not touch his face, as Simon should have or could have, but she would kiss his dirty feet. And so if we're going to use our Wesleyan quadrilateral and start asking questions about this, what might be the experience that we could understand, or what is the tradition that we understand about this? She had come with no basin, no water, no towel, and nevertheless, she began to kiss his feet. And her tears began to flow. She was obviously overwhelmed. And mind you, this wasn't planned. This is obviously, she came with a bottle to perfume his feet, but she didn't come with anything to clean his feet. But nonetheless, she was still so overwhelmed by being in the presence of Jesus that she began to cry. So much so that her tears fell on, her, on his feet. And? Something most unusual as well for this woman, and maybe for a lot of people, is she began to use her hair to clean Jesus' feet. The tears began to flow. The woman must have noted the little streams of tears that carried off the dust from the road as well while she did that. And so let's use our knowledge. Let's use the West Thing quadrilateral. Let's use our knowledge that she used the water of her tears to wash his feet in something that she could hardly have planned in advance. And since there was no towel available, she used her hair. Probably one of her most precious things that she owned. It was not uncommon for women to grow their hair as long as they could and then cut it and give it or sell it away. And this woman still had her hair. This was a valuable commodity she had as along with this perfume as well. That would say something about the indicative about her beauty that she had. So imagine this woman using her hair, the most glorious part of her body that she's able to take care of to dry off her feet. And she persisted to kiss the feet of our Lord. This woman worshipped Jesus, was at great cost to her, and the cost of the expensive vial of perfume as well, and the humility of this kiss, of kissing somebody's feet to wash and dry it. But there was a higher price that was still paid by this woman. 
That, that wasn't enough. There's still more, right? In my opinion, the greatest price which she paid was facing the scorn and rejection and the self-righteousness of the Pharisees who had gathered at this dinner feast, who all knew what they were doing and how they were treating Jesus. They were all aware of what they were seeing and expecting. Jesus did not give her a dirty look. He did not condemn her. And it's inconceivable us to think that all the others did not. Simon's disdain revealed his inner thoughts that he must have been evident in his eyes and probably all too much for the other guests to, to ignore. Today we would say, read the room. Hey, Jesus, read the room. We're not cool with this happening. And sometimes we get a little self-righteous in our day and age because we think that, oh, I see what's going on here. They didn't see what was going on. Well, just because it happened 2,000 years ago does not mean they were idiots. They just didn't have the context that we have. And so Jesus absolutely read the room. He knew what was going on. What in the world are you doing here? must have been etched on everybody's faces. And then Jesus, that wasn't his concern as well. So later on in Scripture, we have still from chapter 7, 39 through 43, we have this understanding that no doubt the great part of Simon's motivation was probably to check Jesus out. That's why he invited us to this dinner. This woman was never part of his story or part of his plan, but she usurped the entire story, right? And so Simon had invited Jesus probably to ask some questions like, what was this man really like? Are you really a prophet? Do you want me to believe your message? How do you expect other people to believe your message? Was he a threat? Was he an ally? Was this somebody that I, he could turn to his cause? Is this something that we could use Jesus to make sure we maintain the distance between us, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the professional religious leaders, and them, the poor, the downtrodden, the sinners? These might have been some of the questions that Simon was asking. And Simon's re, 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 uh, in real time, having to realize what's happening. So here's the premise. If Jesus were a prophet, he would know people's character, right? But we, we probably could make that assessment. And if Jesus knew this woman was a sinner, he would have nothing to do with her. That's two premises that Simon's working from. But the conclusion for us that we understand is that since Jesus has accepted this woman, he doesn't know her character. Is Jesus the fool? And since Jesus doesn't know this woman is a sinner, he can't be a prophet, this is in real time what Simon's figuring out. And since Jesus is not a prophet, we can reject him, his message, and his ministry. But this story is so compelling, everybody stopped to watch what this woman was doing nonetheless. Because in real time, they were experiencing God in powerful ways. Simon was reading a nine, and Jesus was trying to help him. It's not a nine or a six. This is something entirely different. The problem with the logic is the same problem with computers. If the output is only reliable as your input, and Simon doesn't have all the input. To put it differently, there was nothing wrong with Simon's logic other than the fact that he had based his conclusion on a faulty premise. He didn't understand that Jesus was Lord. This woman, this pariah of the community, she got it. And one of the most powerful men of the entire community, he didn't. So his first premise is that Jesus were, was a prophet. He would be able to discern the character of those around him. And that was correct. Jesus did discern the character of those around him and went way beyond Simon's understanding of it as well. And he was also able to know the thoughts of Simon, his host, by conveying to Simon that he knew his thoughts. And Jesus proved that he was at least a prophet in his mind. Simon's second premise was entirely wrong, reflecting on this erroneous thinking as a Pharisee. Remember, the Pharisees, which means separate, their entire faith basis was based on these 613 laws from the Old Testament, this Mosaic law, that if you followed it, it presented with you the opportunity to distance yourself from anyone and everything that might cause you to sin. In Jesus' example, he's doing something wildly different. He is drawn to the sinners. The sinners are drawn to him. But mind you, and this is something very important, the sinners' lives are changed. Jesus never changes, right? Jesus definitely spent time with the sinners. And the sinners flocked to him, but Jesus remains holy. Those who interact with Jesus, they experience forgiveness of sin. They're reminded to repent, to turn away. 
And so the question which best expressed this whole issue for the Pharisees and the drawback from Jesus is found in early gospel accounts. It reminds us here, from, uh, this is from Luke and Matthew and Mark as well, but we have the scripture that says, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and the sinners? This is the question that Jesus received, and probably more than just three times in the gospel, probably multiple times. And Simon could not conceive of Jesus knowing and allowing a woman to touch him by washing his feet, but nonetheless... He allowed it to happen. And why would Jesus associate with sinners? Because Jesus gave the answer by telling a story and then extracting this principle about amazing forgiveness. He told him the story about people who had borrowed money and one had borrowed 10 times more than the other and the other money lender forgave the debt of both of these people. Jesus asked Simon, which of the two would have loved the money lender more? And he discerned. He used his uh, intelligence as well. And he said, the one who owed the most. Jesus confirmed the truth of that response. This would be underlying the principle for us that those who are forgiven most love the most. Those who are forgiven the most love the most. And Jesus now takes this principle and applies it to Simon and to this sinful woman as well in this example. And Simon shuns the woman because she was a sinner expecting Jesus to do likewise. That's what we do, Jesus. We religious folks, we shun the sinners. And Jesus rebukes him by showing him that every respect that the woman has outdone Simon in her act of love and devotion. And Simon didn't show Jesus even the minimum courtesy of washing his feet or presenting him with a kiss or anointing his head with clean oil. Simon didn't do any of that. And this woman had done even more. The woman had outdone Simon by showing her love of the Lord. The woman was at least, in Simon's mind, a greater sinner, right? If we were going to measure sin, which, if anything reminds me, there's no scale that we've been given in Scripture about what is the greatest of sin for us. But nonetheless, the woman was, as Jesus pointed out, the greatest lover as well. And from this story from which Jesus told, from the, uh, from the supper from which Simon had held, the one who was forgiven the most was loved even more. Now, here's, here's a little presenting question for us theologically. This is where we start using our brain. This woman obviously loved Jesus more. Was she forgiven because she loved? Or was it her faith? Sometimes we think that if I love more, if I do more, then I will receive I will receive the gift of Jesus Christ. But the truth is, it's cheaper than that. It's cheaper than that. All we have to do is ask for it, receive it. I don't have to do anything. Although, because of the love I have for my Lord, I'm compelled to do many things. I'm compelled to love many people as well. So Jesus' word to the woman here, the rest of the chapter of uh, seven so that when Jesus speaks to the woman in the final verse of our passage, he makes it clear to her the basis of her forgiveness. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And let there be no doubt that the basis for one's forgiveness, it's not the works, it's not the love of loving others, but it's this great thing that we embody when we are a part of the church and we can wrap our head around the fact that it's our faith in our Savior. Forgiveness is the gift of God that is granted to all who have faith. Little faith, large faith, faith for generations, faith that I just figured out in the last 15 minutes before I die on the cross, next to Jesus being the other, other thief. The question is, what was it that the woman believed by faith? If the woman's faith saved her, was it the substance of her faith, or what did the woman believe that saved her? The woman believed that if she came to Jesus as a repentant sinner, Jesus would not send her away. She didn't have to have it all figured out before she went into that house. She didn't have to clean up her life. She didn't have to have the right clothes. She didn't have to say the right words. She didn't have to have the right job. She didn't have to have the right story that had everything perfect. She came to him just as she was. The bad news for the Pharisee, Jesus is associated with sinners. So the Pharisees did not want to spend Jesus, time with Jesus if he was going to spend time with the sinners. But not all the Pharisees and Sadducees felt the same way. Some of them were looking at a nine. Some of them were looking at a six. Some of them are still trying to figure out. And the only people who will bristle at the thought that Jesus has come to seek and to save sinners are the self-righteous. That's what Jesus made clear. Those who do not think that they need saved. This woman did not dispute the fact that she was a sinner. She knew it. They all knew it, but she rejoiced at the reports that Jesus 
receives sinners. This is good news for you and for me because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And that's part of our identity. I don't have to live terribly and remind myself, Phil, you are a sinner. And I live with that, but I am also redeemed because of the love of Jesus Christ. She came to him as a sinner and believed by faith that he would not send her away. She nailed it. And she was right of all those who went to that dinner. Only this woman is said to have left forgiven. Oh, gosh. Maybe there's some things I want to do in my life a little differently. Maybe some things I thought I was doing correctly all along that I thought was a six was maybe a nine, or maybe it was a nine, or maybe it was a six, or maybe we're all right, or maybe we need to wrestle with some of those questions. The marvelous grace of God toward we sinners. The first lesson of this incident is that Christ came to seek and to save sinners. Boom. That's the good news. It doesn't have to be super more complicated, although we, we sometimes make it more complicated, right? A woman who was considered a great sinner by her peers was forgiven by her Lord, while those who thought themselves righteous went away unforgiven that evening. Maybe they were forgiven another day. Maybe they figured it out. And I, I'm, I'm still on that path of figuring things out too, but I do know that I'm forgiven because I've asked for it. And I know that's the case for you as well, which is why when we celebrate communion like we are this morning, when we come to the Lord's table, we ask God to do something with our sins, to wipe it clean, to wash it clean, to wash it away, so that I might be in that more intimate, perfect relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, that we might see the world transition and transformed. There's a strange attraction to Christ for those who will admit that they are sinners and wish to turn from their sins because we all want to have that acceptance. We don't want to be the people who are pushing away. We don't want to be the Pharisees and Sadducees. And Jesus is never more approachable than he is to Sinners, to me, to you, to a world that needs a Savior. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we ask you to continue to, to speak to us, to guide us and direct us, that we might become a little closer to you. And I'm so thankful that we don't have to go the route of this woman to be able to experience you, that we can come to you in the here and now, regardless of where we've been or what we said or what we've done or what we've been a part of. Or, Lord, you know but you have forgiven us and that has been wiped clean away that I can stand before you because of your love, because you have sanctified us. Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon these elements that we're going to experience this morning that when you got together with your disciples, you reminded us that we could enjoy this cup and enjoy this bread and be reminded of the sacrifice that you were going to give. And the disciples and the friends in that room, they didn't understand it quite just yet. But we understand it today, Lord, and we want to continue to understand it more. And so as we experience it this morning and as you allow us to experience you in new and powerful ways, change us, Lord, direct us, Lord, and guide us. In your name we pray. Amen.